So welcome one and all to this uh, live event hosted by Business Sweden. Uh, we're here at the UN Climate Conference COP26 in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. My name is Nick Nuttall. Uh, I'm your moderator. I'm with We Don't Have Time TV uh, and had 17 years as a career in the United Nations on environmental and climate issues. Today we are looking in brief, if I can put it that way, into how energy efficiency can help the world get on track for 1.5 degrees centigrade. That's the safety goal that the world has decided we need if we are going to deal with climate change, dangerous climate change. We're also looking at the role of innovation and we're also of course going to look at digitalization. And it's not just about energy efficiency as we know. We also need clean energy as well to partner energy efficiency in this energy transformation. I would like to first welcome our keynote speaker and opening speaker and kind of scene setter. Uh, the name is Vida Rosita. Now I hope I get that right when she comes in on the magic of Zoom. Uh, she's a senior expert in the energy efficiency division uh, of the International Energy Agency. Is it Vida Rosita or how do I pronounce that? Hi, thank you. The pronunciation is great. I can't believe it. All right. Well, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, jag är glad att ha möjligheten att delta i denna viktiga diskussionen i Svenska paviljongen idag. As I was saying, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to participate in this valuable and extremely timely discussion here at the Swedish Pavilion today. I'm Vida Rosita from the International Energy Agency and I lead our work on uh, the energy efficiency divisions that work on digitalization. I'd like to start off the discussion with a synopsis of some highlights from recent IEA analysis. As we all know, CO2 emissions are on an upwards trajectory. Energy efficiency is absolutely crucial to enable clean energy transitions. Urgent and relentless action on energy efficiency is needed for net zero emissions by 2050 pathways. Our analysis indicates that globally energy efficiency annual implementation needs to at least double and investments need to triple over the coming decade. We are not on track. We uh, released our clean energy progress today, tracking clean energy progress today. And apart from some positive trends in terms of electric vehicles and efficient lighting, we are lagging on all other areas. Every investment today in inefficient technologies and solutions locks in higher than necessary energy demand and takes us further from net zero and massively increases the costs of achieving clean energy transition. With increasing electrification, energy efficiency becomes even more crucial. Our power systems will struggle to handle the use of inefficient technologies coupled with new demand, especially in evenings with heating or cooling coinciding with electric vehicle charging. This calls for an ex expansion of the scope of energy efficiency and its role in helping to make demand more flexible and to help shift demand from peak times to times when renewables are plentiful. Digitalization is a promising lever that can open up for new business models to facilitate investments in energy efficiency, create opportunities for using technologies more efficiently and enable demand side flexibility. However, we're nowhere near tapping into the potential that digitalization can unlock and there are still a myriad of issues and risks that need to be tackled. Industry is at the core of enabling faster progress on energy efficiency and can play an absolutely decisive role in reducing its own energy demand and creating the products, technologies and services needed to reduce demand in other sectors. We've been talking about energy efficiency for decades. The benefits of energy efficiency are undeniable, but implementation has still remained incremental. A few years ago, I would have asked what we can do to mainstream consideration of energy efficiency. Today, what I'd like to ask is what we can do to make energy efficiency the default option across the board, and what are the smart policies, the new business models, innovative financing options, and technology combinations that will get us on track towards net zero. I very much look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Vida. Um, I've just got a couple of questions to you, uh, just building on your, your opening keynote there. Um, science tells us we need to halve our emissions by 2030 if to even have an even chance 
of, of you know, getting to net zero in 2050. I suppose the question is, in my head and maybe the heads of others, is what proportion of that halving of emissions up to 2030 could reasonably come from the whole energy efficiency story? Is that known or is that just still theoretical? Uh, we, we have in our um, roadmap towards net zero looked into what, what are the opportunities in the side of energy efficiency and in the initial, initial stages of, of going towards net zero energy efficiency play, plays the bulk in terms of uh, reducing emissions and enabling for uh, the deployment of other technologies. That's very uh, of important. course, yeah. uh, the pathways for each country will, will be, of course, different, but energy efficiency is, is absolutely crucial and it's absolutely essential to start with energy efficiency now. Yeah, that's right, because we always talk about the waste of materials and the waste of other things in the circular economy, but energy efficiency is dealing with the waste in energy, isn't it? And that's, that's absolutely critical. Let me ask you one other question because I just think it's important too. We are in the business Sweden uh, and the Swedish pavilion here today, but there are people here from developing countries, for example. Um, what is the role of energy efficiency in a developing country? And of course, there are many kinds of developing countries. There's rapidly developing and there's developing. Actually, there are, I think the whole term developing is a bit out of date, quite frankly. But anyway, there are some poorer countries, some richer countries, some semi-rich countries. What does energy efficiency play in those countries with particularly low emissions? energy efficiency plays a, a extremely important role in these countries especially when we consider that these are countries that are still growing their economies still growing their industries energy efficiency will allow uh, curtailing and escalation of uh, emissions also when we consider that a lot of the infrastructure is still yet to be built so this is an opportunity now to build the infrastructure that will be in place for, for decades and make sure that it's energy efficiency. So I, I would say that for emerging economies, energy efficiency plays an extremely important role. And also, as we've seen now that escalating energy prices have uh, caused issues in terms of access, energy efficiency can also play a role in uh, improving access to, to energy and reducing the burden on households. Okay, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And don't go away, because we want you to stay on the show. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our panel. I'm going to call them up to the stage uh, one by one. Uh, first, uh, I have uh, Jonas uh, Gustavsson, uh, who's uh, president and CEO of AFRI. AFRI, AFRI. Ah, he's coming in on the magic of Zoom. Fantastic. Then we have Madeleine Gilborn, who's vice president of clean tech at Alpha Laval. That sounded quite Swedish, didn't it? Alpha Laval. Yes. I did quite well there, I thought. Um, and then we have Mats Pelbeck Sharp, uh, Head of Sustainability for Ericsson. Then I have Johan uh, Siedrustum. Thank you, not bad. Yeah? Okay, Executive Vice President of more regions of the world than I care to mention or head uh, with uh, Hitachi Energy. Fantastic. And then Lena Huck. Senior Vice President of Sustainability for Skanska, and I think she is coming in also by the magic of Zoom. Ah, there we go. So there's Jonas Gustavsson, correct? And there is our wonderful lady from Skanska. Super, Lena, great. So I'm going to ask some general questions first to kick off, get things warmed up, and then what we're going to try and do is uh, maybe unpack this in terms of different companies, but all aiming with either energy efficiency or with clean energy towards the wonderful goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Okay, first question. Okay, so setting the scene again, we need big leaps in innovation, in energy, clean energy, and uh, energy efficiency. Uh, many believe that most of the carbon dioxide emission reductions technologies uh, through to 2030 are already available. Yeah? Uh, existing technologies, that's great, but in 2050 almost half of the reductions come from technologies that are not actually currently available, often in demonstration or prototype phases, according to quite a few experts. Uh, major efforts must take place this decade to accelerate all these transitions today. Uh, I could bloody blah about this, but you know all about it anyway, my experts, so I'm going to go straight to the question. 
The question is not whether, but when will the world take the next step in accelerating the transition to a more sustainable future through the lens of energy, clean energy and energy efficiency? And are we on the right track? Are we on the right track? Who would like to take that first question? Yes, please. So, so ladies and gentlemen, um, um, I believe that we are heading towards 2.7 degrees temperature rise, which is devastating. So the, the, the need to act now is, is now. On the positive side, technology is there, as you said, to make a lot of momentum. Transparency is there to a bit be bigger co um, uh, concern than, than earlier. So I think companies like the people represented on this panel really feel the need to be transparent. We also see that capital goes more to green companies, to real green companies, which is really good. So I say that we are on the right track, but we need to speed up. Yeah. But I must say that coming to COP has been very refreshing. The CEOs of the companies we met are all ready to collaborate more, innovate more, and really show action. Excellent. Anybody else like to come? Matt? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, we have subsidies, uh, according to IMF, of 11 billion dollars per minute, if you include some of the, of the negative costs of, of fossil fuels. Yeah. And, and those subsidies are really, really problematic to, to sort of do the transition. So I think one of the questions are, are in relation to those subsidies. Uh, the good news is that uh, as these subsidies are in fact uh, higher than the profits of the oil companies, when the subsidies go away, the bottom will fall flat out of fossil fuels and solar and wind are much cheaper than running coal or, or oil plants, which means that the transition can go extremely fast when it happens. But I think the key element is when can we stop the subsidies. And, and um, we heard yesterday about people talking, we had talked about this forever. Yeah, we have talked about it forever, but we haven't done anything about it. And yeah. that's the key thing, I think. No, it's good to remind everybody about that. In fact, if you want to pop by the We Don't Have Time, well, it's actually the Nordic Pavilion where We Don't Have Time is broadcasting every night. You can see a, a little ticker that we've got and it shows how much money has been spent on fossil fuel subsidies since the COP started. And it's eye-watering, absolutely eye-watering. Um, anybody else want to take up this uh, initial question or I shall I move on? Uh, yes, yes, Madeline. Bit, yeah. Yes. On the positive side though, I just listened to Mr. Barrell, um, who is the executive president of International Energy Agency. And um, he was saying also though, the commitments we've done just in the last days, we are actually heading towards 1.8 degrees. Okay. So yes, we are making a, a difference and then with the commitments we make. But it's a difference going from commitment to action. Yeah. And I think that's where we as an industry come into this. And we need to make sure that uh, sort of we make these solutions scalable and affordable. Uh, and that's also, I think, why it's so important that we are here today uh, as an industry to push this into actions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tried to give up smoking for years and years and years, and I promised that I would do it. And it took a very nasty chest cold in Madrid at the last COP to shock me out of my lethargy into real action. So sometimes you need a shock too. Uh, anybody else uh, from uh, Zoom World uh, want to come in on this? Well, I can, um, I can maybe, uh, I, basically I will echo what uh, Mats and also Johan said. I'm, um, I'm quite positive. I mean, we are active in energy uh, products across the world. And, but I, I also see the problem with subsidies that is directed in the wrong direction. And um, this morning we were had a session about how can we actively support, uh, you said not develop, but for example, we knew Africa. So how can we ensure that we are um, uh, using the latest technology uh, in those parts of the world where it really can make a difference? Um, so um, I am equally a bit concerned about subsidies, but I'm positive with the technology available. Okay, maybe uh, we could go on to the second question and I hope that some of our other speakers that haven't spoken yet could come in, uh, like uh, Lina uh, from Skanska. Um, the second question really is, um, yeah, we're going to require massive deployment of renewable energy. Uh, that's absolutely clear. Technologies such as renewable, wind and solar and electric vehicles and energy efficient building retrofits, so that's covering a lot of things, between now and 2030. Do we have policies that are missing? Are there policies out there that could actually speed up this kind of 
deployment of clean energy, but also energy efficiency as well. I mean, buildings, I think we think immediately of building codes, right, uh, which are growing in the NDCs and national plans of governments, but really not anywhere where they need to be. So who would like to come in on this? Policies I think I, can, I yeah. can have a comment on that one. Okay. Uh, representing the construction industry and also recognizing that the construction industry stands for approximately 40% of the energy related carbon emission comes from the built environment. So we need to be a big player here when it comes to coming up with solutions. And just like you're stating there, it is today possible to build energy positive buildings. That means buildings that are actually producing by themselves more energy than what is needed during the whole lifetime of the building, including energy needed to produce the materials as well as operating the building during a lifespan of 50 years. So what is needed today is to scale up these kinds of amazing building Today, we, do, we are even able to do an energy positive building from a retrofit, just like you stated. And there are plenty of buildings that would need to be retrofitted. So in order for policy to ensure that we have a, a pub, public procurement pushing for sustainable solutions, just like these ones, as well as to ensure that it's possible to share energy between buildings. Because once these buildings are up and running, they are actually powerhouses producing power, possible to share to charge electric vehicles, or for that part, to share with other buildings in its surroundings. So uh, that would be two policy changes that I would wish for. It's interesting because um, on a recent We Don't Have Time show, we had some uh, chap in who is actually a scientist from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but also he's on the UNEP International Resource Panel. And he said in America, people get tax breaks uh, to actually build bigger houses. So there is no incentive to actually have a, a compact house. Once you make enough money, you've got an incentive to make it bigger, build a bigger house, which seems kind of sort of slightly again at odds with, with the, the best policy options available to government. So I think policy very important. Anybody else want to handle that question? Are we got missing policies out there? Yes, please, please. I, I, th I think we have a super opportunity when it comes to public tender to look into the green aspect as, as well, the green procurement. Yeah. Uh, irritatingly enough, we have a lot of uh, evaluation based on price only, and then uh, we are not doing what we should. So yeah. it's immense opportunity with green procurement. We can do even more of co-creation for innovation with projects. We have a lot in the energy sector, and that's happening as we speak. I see also that we need a price for carbon and, and that you were into it in the beginning and that's yeah. probably the most important one and Mats was into it as well. Yeah. Um, I think we also need to stimulate smart business models and, and um, Madeleine was into that and how can we do that with policy making as well. Anybody else want to jump in on this? Madeleine? Well, yes, I mean, uh, like you said in your introduction, majority of the, some of these technologies are in the sort of pilot or demonstration phase. Um, and to make us to the net zero target, we need to make these scalable and affordable in a very uh, short time manner to, to make the, the targets. And I think also we need um, to mobilize financial resources for the first mover advantage because these are sometimes uh, small companies. We have an important part to play as partnerships and, and collaborations, but it's also important that policy incentivize these first movers so we scale and deploy these technologies. But what is the role of government here? I, I mean, sometimes I, I've seen reports that say that government spending on R&D has been going down over time. Is there a role of government to de-risk new technologies uh, that could be very useful by 2050? I mean, you might even talk about nuclear uh, uh, fusion, uh, which some people think one day could be the saviour of everything. I don't know. But uh, not fission, by the way, it's just about fusion. Um, but yeah, anybody got a thought on the government's role in this? Bats, do you want yeah, to say something? Well, I think that uh, uh, we have the sun, so I don't think we need any fusion, to be perfectly honest. I okay. think 11% of the surface of Sahara covered with solar cells will cover the global planet energy yep. needs. So I, I don't think, I mean, it's shining every day. And I think reflection is 95% is of what is shined in, so otherwise we will be even heater. So I think, I mean, hotter. So, so I think fr from that perspective, it, 
we can use already, as you said from the beginning, existing sources, just use them smarter and, and secure that we have the logistics of energy. And it, it, we don't have an energy problem, S strangely enough. We have a transportation problem of energy uh, in the world. We, we, we take care of that. <laughs> ah, it's actually for sure. Anyway. <laughs> for sure. Everything's solved, but, guys. But, we can but, all go home now. But <laughs> one thing, one, one, one more, Nick, one more thing on the policy side I think that is in fact important, and that is we need to connect all of these things. And we don't have, I mean, there is an investment gap uh, on, on the connectivity side. Because if we want to have a stable grid and an efficient way of driving these systems, when they get sort of distributed, instead of having one central part, we lose the inertia in the electricity systems where, where the big generators in the coal power plants are now sort of stabilizing the, your whole grid. And then we need to control all the loads and everything to, to keep it stable, otherwise we will have uh, blackouts all the time. Yeah. Uh, and to do that we need to connect everything. So we need to connect all the, all the electric vehicles, everything, all the buildings that are then sort of smart and, and, and uh, electrified. Uh, but then you need sort of a 5G system. And we don't invest in the digital infrastructure in parallel to the existing infrastructure, the other infrastructure. In fact, we treat the digital infrastructure like something that, that should take care of itself. I mean, 5G in Italy, yeah. the, you pay yeah. 6 uh, mil, billion euros to get the license to start building the infrastructure. In other places, you get paid to build the infrastructure, you get subsidies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To build mobile infrastructure, you have to prepay a license fee that costs you a lot of money that takes away the investment and the speed out of rolling out these essential networks. So definitely a connection between infrastructures from a policy perspective is needed. Anything from... I'm very conscious when people are on Zoom that, that it's easy to forget that you're there, uh, but not with your fantastic smiling faces. Um, anybody want to comment on this or we move on to the next... Next question. Well, I can pitch in there ah. regarding the need for large scale energy storage, possibilities to, to actually storage what is renewable energy sources. And the Skanska has in, invented a solution on thermal energy storage, which is quite large scale. In order to make such things happen, there is a governmental and national uh, plan that needs to take place to encourage industry to come forth with these kinds of innovations, as well as to invest in long-term, large-scale energy storage for renewables, acting like a battery, but actually using thermal technologies. So having more of those visionary plans, as well as actions when it comes to industrial solutions and energy infrastructures investment. We did it some hundred years ago when it comes to the water energy and how to harvest that. Let us do it again. And I think Sweden could have an advantage. We have already, already succeeded in having more folks uh, being attracted to Sweden. Let's see what we can do on the energy side here. Okay, uh, Vida from the International Energy Agency, you wanted to make a, a brief comment. Just a very brief comment. I, I completely agree with the panelists that policies are absolutely crucial and that we do need to look into what are the innovative policy options to create stronger investment incentives to, to drive investments towards the deployment of energy efficiency and clean energy solutions. I, I also fully agree for the need around uh, more systematic solutions. Uh, but one thing to consider and one thing that, that concerns me in this context is that when we look at the, the time frame and we look at uh, traditional energy efficiency policies or policies in general, they generally have a, a relatively long lead time in, in terms of being developed, in terms of being more made more stringent, in terms of being implemented. So I, I'd be very keen to hear more about what, what are the opportunities for, for businesses to take on an even more driving role in terms of showing what are the solutions that are possible, how is it possible to drive down pr prices, make things more affordable, and uh, start pushing, putting some pressure on policymakers and showing that we're able to deliver much better, much higher rates of energy efficiency than even foreseen in existing policies and it's yeah. time to ramp up progress. I think it's important that we, we don't lose sight of what some of the people have said here about getting a price on carbon because, you know, normally the polluter pays, right? And, and getting a price on carbon, whatever the right price is, is always an interesting debate. But to have a proper price on carbon and a stable price on carbon, because that's what investors need. They've, 
they don't want a, a kind of casino of, uh, I mean, some people like casinos, but I think if we're going to actually deal with climate change, we need a stable price on carbon. Uh, and we're not there yet on that for sure. Let's just ask about energy efficiency in particular. Why is it the Cinderella of this energy story? Why is it the one that's not been invited to the ball so often? Um, is it because it's not sexy? Or is it because, because you know, renewables are a bit more exciting, aren't they? Wind and solar and things like that. Or is it because perhaps it was seen as not having the highest rate of return in terms of investment? Because I think of the International Energy Agency, which was well supported, but the UN Secretary General's Sustainable Energy for All, which was led by the time uh, with, by Rachel Kite, was focusing a lot on energy efficiency, but it never seemed to quite take off in the same way as the International Renewable Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi. So just a quick answer on this. Is it perspective? Is there a re reality that people aren't aware of? Or am I just talking uh, through my hat? Everybody loves energy efficiency. It's equal to renewable energy in the eyes of investors. Or somebody just help me out on that question. Well, I think you're on to it. I mean, oh, it, it's not... Okay. Um it doesn't get the intention uh, in the decarbonization um, topic as, as it deserves. Right. Because as, as Vida was talking about, I mean, it counts for 40% of the emission savings we need in the coming 20 years. So it has a massive potential. Because sometimes when we look at the net zero targets, we talk about just reducing the carbon emissions. But we have to remember, at the same time, we have a 50% energy increase. So the energy we produce, we must use it in an efficient way. So the, the question is, a kilowatt of SEDA energy should have equally uh, important to play as we produce a kilowatt of clean energy. And it doesn't have today. And I think it, it's um, the good, it, it, the technologies are there. They are all there. Uh, they are affordable, uh, offer often low risk because these are well proven technologies. Um, and they offer really good payback. Uh, but I think it, it goes across so many sectors. So it's not sexy, it's, um, what should you say, um, difficult sometimes from a policy makers to make it easy to incentivize that you really don't get the movement in terms of implementing these solutions. And the price on carbon would certainly help energy efficiency as much as it would help uh, renewable energy investments and others. Yes, correct, uh, Johan? Yeah, I, I, um, I come from ABB and there we were the experts of energy efficiency and now I work for Itachi, we're experts of deploying renewable energy and I think we need to do both. I think it's like you said, uh, Nick, that uh, Madeleine also, it's easier to show physically what you do when you do, when you build solar pl plants, when you build uh, yeah. uh, wind offshore wind uh, plants yeah. and when you do interconnections, then to show in reality how much you save energy. So we need to, to help each other to do both because we need both. And on top of it, we need 5G. We need the, the digitalization because everything needs to be smarter. Yes. No, you make a very good point there because uh, in some countries, everybody loves the big the big project, right, that, that, that they can sell as a minister or a prime minister or a president. And something about energy efficiency is like, well, that doesn't allow me to actually get votes in the next election because it's not big and, and glamorous and glittery. So oh, maybe there's something in the human spirit that leads to a preference for renewable versus energy efficiency. Um, I'm very conscious that um, my first speaker, uh, Jonas, has been very quiet. Jonas, can you hear us here in uh, Scotland? Oh, I, I hear you. I, I hear you. And I, coming back to this, I, I mean, from our company point of view, we are not a manufacturer, but we are an integrator in, in the field of energy. So I will say that of the last, which I think is positive, we have seen, of course, a lot of big scale, large scale product in renewables. You said they are sexy and they are cool, but they are also for real. And we see in Sweden, for example, tremendous activities up in the northern part where access of clean energy will be the, the, the base for a lot of things. But we also see a tremendous amount of smaller products in energy efficiency right now. So if I would just measure on our business over the last 12, 24 months, the number of smaller scale but important energy efficiency products have increased quite a lot. Is it enough? Maybe not. But I think that's the positive side. Then I'm the full support for carbon price. And I think the good thing is that right now we see it's increasing and there's a fork because we also work with energy forecasting and it looks like it will continue to increase and that's really a good thing. So I'm, uh, I'm hopeful. Excellent. 
What about some of these uh, countries out there that seem to be struggling with climate uh, ambition? Um, I'm thinking of some of the northern, big northern European countries. Some, they're partly in Europe, they're partly in Asia. Um, sometimes we think of some of the countries in Latin America and things like that. How do we get, you know, what you guys are doing into some of these countries that really are so far behind not just the promises and the pledges, but the reality of climate action, and they are very important countries in this story of climate change. How do we get what you're doing into these countries? What, what would break down the barriers there? And are you doing it already? Are you in some of these? I could name them if you like, but I think everybody knows who I'm talking about. Yeah. I, I, I can start since I have a global role working for a global company in Touchy. We have dialogue with, with uh, people from all countries basically and everyone is really having the ambition to go for renewables. Everyone wants to scale out coal, oil and, and, and gas. But it's a matter of time, it's about decisiveness, it's about ambition, it's about money and it's about support from richer countries as well. So I think from that perspective the will is there, the transparency is there, it's been going too slow but we also have a, uh, have a responsibility from, from from the more rich countries to, to support. I think that's what this COP26 is about as well. Uh, so I think from the energy field, we have a lot to do. And uh, we have had meetings with people representing these countries during this COP so far, uh, with really good plans, also achieving financing already. So to, to, to be a little bit positive in the sentiment, I see things happening here, the Delta is, is coming. Well, I, I, I think that uh, uh, when the oil subsidies are reduced or the fossil fuel subsidies are reduced, that will definitely make it much more difficult to continue uh, to drive uh, a fossil-based economy. Yeah. And I think the problem we have is that we are in, in some cases really cheating other countries to start investing coal and oil uh, and, and have been doing that. And I think that that is really <coughs> bad way because as renewables are more cost effective and, and lower cost, that is where we should sort of do that. And I think from that perspective, it is important to, to really take away the subsidies and, and work on, on uh, helping countries to, to do the transition fast. Otherwise, they will get stuck in, in, in something that is then an old technology. And I mm -hmm. think that that is very important. Yes, uh, Jonas. Yeah, no, I just want to echo that then. Um, uh, we are part of a project called Renew Africa, where the whole idea is on how to secure financing for, for renewable uh, energy systems in that part of the world. And we decided, just, uh, we decided to leave any new coal uh, plant new build. Um, we have been in that business for many years. But the sad part was that we left a significant volume on the table that others are doing. So there are still a lot of coal plants that are financed and, and you know the subsidies uh, around and that I think should be a first step to make sure that no money goes into that but then at the same time steer the money with legislation and support to ensure new technologies because the technologies are available that's why we we are sticking to Africa we have people you know we, we, we even though so so that's that's a bit concern um, echoing what Matt said could we look at something which isn't on the, the list of questions here a little bit? Because I think this is very important and, and sometimes doesn't come up. But, um, you know, in the end, what we're talking about here is we're talking about business, we're talking about governments, but we're actually talking about people. Because as we've all said before, the planet will probably do quite well without us uh, if we all kind of wipe ourselves out through climate change. Um, but when I think about people, I think about jobs. I think about work. I think about employment, 7 billion people going to over 10 billion by 2050. And, and funny enough, I met a guy in Scotland, in Glasgow, in a pub uh, on Friday night when I got up here. And he said, ah, he said, but you know, there's more people employed in oil and gas than there are in renewables. I said, well, I don't think that's right, actually. I think you may find there's more in renewables than in oil and gas. He said, no, it's not possible. And so there are still myths out there about this transition and work. And I'll put the last question to you as well which ties with this. I mean, some economists say to become efficient economies, we squeeze labor right down to the point where the pips were coming out. And now we have to squeeze nature in a nice way. We have to make the most out of everything we've got, whether it be biodiversity or whether it be energy. 
we need to squeeze the resources so we are not inefficient any longer. Now in that there is a story of work for people. So maybe we could just explore that a little bit with your businesses, with your vision of the future, where do you think this will lead to in terms of more employment and decent employment? Matt. I have two things there. I think um, the last year of, of President <coughs> Trump, um, there were uh, 8,000 lo jobs lost in the coal sector when he was subsidizing coal. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there were over 10,000 jobs created in the renewable sector building uh, wind and solar farms in USA. So I think that it's clear that if you let the market forces work, the transition go will go faster than if politicians sort of try to maintain the old economy. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there will be so many jobs created in relation to 5G digitalization, and there will be more advanced jobs and, and also tools to train people in a totally different way. In our factory in, in, in US, we use VR technology. It's a 5G factory, so it's all 5G. We use technology for people to be thought and, and trained on the job, they can see what they should do, they get to practice all the time and they can do it while you're working. And the, you said we squeeze people, but in this case we improve the efficiency with 30% in the factory. So we have a high, much higher output. At the same time, people feel better, they get trained and, and they get good jobs. So I think uh, there is a myth that, that uh, digitalization will take away jobs or, 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 or change, but it's, there is a transition, yes. All the people working with, with heavy jobs and, and dirty jobs, they will need to be thought and taken care of, and the transition needs to be taken care of in a really good way and, and a, a really human way. Mm -hmm. But there will be more jobs in all industrial revolutions that we have had in the past. We come out with more jobs than before, but other jobs. So I think that that is where we need to sort of steer the debate instead of just focusing on the jobs that go away. Yeah. Um, so let me go over to uh, Johan uh, there. Uh, how do you perceive this? No, I perceive it the same way as Mats. Uh, I'm coming from ABB and we were the world leader in robotics. All the countries who applied robotics created more jobs. So it, 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 it is like that. And yesterday I had a discussion together with my CEO and the CEO of a big utility in Africa. And they are now going to do this transition from oil and coal to renewables and the job change will happen and yeah. they are convinced and they are stimulated by us. So I'm, I'm really alluding to what you were saying and this is giving an advantage for the countries as well. I think still the richer countries need to support because it's a financing question when we do the transition. It's a lot sitting in the balance sheet so we need really to work as one team in this planet now. We, cannot, we maybe have a plan B, but we don't have a planet B, so we also need to be generous of, of, of real. Of real. And, and we representing Sweden here, we are really sitting on a gold mine mm -hmm. uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to climate, and we mm -hmm. can be supporting as well. Uh, yes, uh, please. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I see the same thing, and I agree that there will be your great, but I also think that we have to think of the transition and respect yeah. it then and we need to work in a different way yeah. to retrain and partner up between you know universities uh, uh, the governments uh, the companies because the transitions in a smaller scale is already ongoing we just look on the automotive industry just in a few years now we have gone from combustion engine technology to electrification so already today we have uh, a lot of people that that are have the competence in one area that will need to be transformed into other areas. It can be done, but it needs to be thought through and we need to do it jointly together. But there will be job available, but for sure we can just see in our company that we need to be ahead of the game and retrain and keep an eye on competence development more than ever before. Because I would say in all segments there is heavy transformation that is ongoing, which are end of the day good, but we need to support our you know, uh, people into that new part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do are all your products? Oh my God! We just lost the signal. No, there we go. Come back again. The magic of Zoom again. Um, do you think there is a future for repair, repairing consumer products, but industrial products? That there's jobs in that, and we extend the life cycle of the average product. Is this important? I think we need to design for recycling and circular yeah. economy, that's super key. And I said to you before we started this panel, we need to go into biodiversity as well. That's the, that's the secret sauce on top of it, because specimens are dying every, every day as we speak, yeah. and, and, and that's another panel. But on recycling, you, you bet. I mean, 
Right now we represent Sweden. A lot of things are cooking when it comes to green mining, green steel and green batteries. And they all think through the recycling piece and, and the circularity from the beginning. That's very appetizing and that's, that's the future. Yeah, we work a bit with uh, Rag and Cells, yeah. uh, the waste management company in Sweden, where they don't talk about waste tips anymore, they talk about resource yeah. centers. True. Uh, and that's a very interesting concept. Yeah. Okay, well, you mentioned Sweden. Uh, let's get to Sweden. Why is Sweden so special? I, I, I ask this because you know, I, I spend a bit of time in Sweden these days. That you can see from my accent, I'm not Swedish. I'm British, and of course, in the long time ago, Britain used to be quite innovative with all kinds of things. Um, but somehow, Sweden keeps popping up. You know, wherever we are, on being innovation in terms of digitalization, but also you know, energy, you know, efficiency, uh, renewables. I don't know, so many things when I'm there, and so many new apps being developed in Sweden. You know, you, your phone's full of the damn things. They're, they're everywhere with new, crazy and wonderful ideas. So, Sweden's very innovative. What is the secret of this? Why is, I mean, don't confine yourselves to energy efficiency and just energy. What makes you an innovative country? May I? I can start. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it is a tradition of working together and, and sort of being quite pragmatic. Uh, Sweden uh, and Stockholm is uh, the unicorn uh, densest area in the world. You, you have to sort of scale down to Silicon Valley only to get another place where you have more unicorns created per capita than, than, than in Stockholm. Uh, and, and, but you think about it, you think about if you look at Apple, you think Steve Jobs. If you look on, on Tesla, you, you see Elon Musk. If you think about Northvolt, you have two people. If you think about Mojang and, and, and uh, uh, the way that, that uh, Minecraft was built, he always brings out the team. And I think that is the huge difference, that, that we are not one person that sort of creates one thing, because we work more together. As, as, so I think that that is, in fact, a, a fundamental difference in, in, in culture. Uh, so, so that's one thing that I think is key when it comes to, to uh, innovation. It's, it's historical, or can anybody learn to do this? I mean, we, we are a small country also. Now we are 10 million inhabitants, but we used to be even fewer, and we are very dependent on global trade. And I think nobody speaks good English, but everyone speaks English, and we want to trade, and we want to collaborate, academia, government, uh, countries. It's very non-hierarchical. Everyone can call anyone. Uh, we can collaborate. We have a lot of things cooking now when it comes to 5G, A3, uh, Mats and Ericsson, and, and we up in Ludvika, 3,000 people. It's not really time for champagne, but soon. It's happening as we speak. Okay, so there is some kind of secret recipe out there. Um, we'll have to uh, delve deeper on that in, in, in the future, perhaps. Um, well, maybe we can wrap up a little bit here. I think we've all had a good session. Uh, we're a little bit early, but I think that's okay, isn't it, guys? And ladies, yeah. of course. Um, I mean, my take home... Oh, a question from the audience. Why not? What a fool I've been. There's people actually paying attention. Yes. Okay, <laughs> unbelievable. Right. Come down here, say who you are, where you're from. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for a very good session. My name is Vimal Mahendru. I'm originally from India, but I work for the IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission. Some of you must be familiar with it. Uh, my question is, you, you know, I've heard of uh, financing, scalability and availability, affordability, a lot of things. But I've not heard about standards at all. I think that's a, one of those secret mm -hmm. weapons we have to go after really making things scalable and affordable for the whole world. Any thoughts? Yeah, good point. Good yeah, point. I, I, I agree very much. So thanks for raising the question. If you look at uh, electrical motors, for instance, to get to the right standard is really helping energy efficiency big, big time. So. Yeah. Big applause to IEC and, and we have a lot of uh, people in our organization also working with IEC in the Itachi group. I can only agree. I mean, we have it for our consumer products. We have it at home when you dishwasher and so forth. But we do not have it for the industry products. And it's the same for us with heat exchangers. There is a standard, but it's not being implemented enough. And we need more of that to ensure that what we, and also to support governments, that we actually make sure that what we install and what we sort of purchase is the most efficient technologies. And there, then we have that. The yeah. need. Absolutely. I can pitch in on this one as well. 
And thank you so much for, for raising that issue. In the construction and development industry, there are quite a lot of standards as well as certification schemes uh, regarding sustainability. And what's the essence of that is that you get a structure, you get a comparability when it comes to performance as well as impact. And that actually makes the market forces come into play because you can both evaluate as well as value how you perform on the sustainability arena as well so quite important to be able to measure what counts and standards and common definitions are really important for that just a quick comment Nick, yeah. If I may. yeah so coming from the industry of global standards i mean you can use your phone in any country i mean i come to uk i have to have a plug to, to connect to the wall right it's not the same same two holes that i mm -hmm. have it's three holes here so it, i have to use the pen to open it yeah or something ah, you know that trick. yeah yeah, yeah oh, i know okay. that's no but i mean your phone it works everywhere right so and and that's why the mobile technology is so big globally because we have a global standard for for how to build this and it doesn't matter if it's a nokia network or a huawei network or or, or an ericsson network it works everywhere uh, and it, i think that also drives the enormous power of volume and that's why i i mean we talk about different standards for for internet of things and there are slow run different long term it will be the mobile standard because there is such a huge volume we have nine nine billion subscriptions out there already even though it's not nine billion people that uses the technology it's uh, subscriptions in machines and other, other things so that volume will sort of based on on uh, an industry standard in fact has driven the whole uh, technology change and, and the whole mobile revolution 4g and f now 5g but let me let me just come back in a sense on that question which is you can have standards and governments can agree to standards but then they have to enforce them right and there clearly are some areas like mobile phone technology where they're happy to to enforce those but you sometimes think of earthquakes in uh, certain parts of the world and the buildings fall down and everybody goes oh we had a building code we had standards and it turns out whoever built that damn thing didn't follow the standards right basically chose a dodgy concrete or something like that so i think some governments get nervous about standards because they have to in then enforce them and they might be open to some kind of legislation or legal action if they don't actually do it properly so but Please, not just developing countries, right? Not far from London, there's a tower there that burnt down a few years ago. So uh, standards can be dodgy all over the place. But in principle, they're very important, but they have to be enforced by the governments. Is that right? And the cities, etc. Okay. Um, we've got a gentleman here. Say who you are and where you're from. Yes, my name is Freeman Eloho. I'm from Nigeria. I work right. for an NGO. Africa Center for Climate Action and Rural Development. I have a very simple and direct question. The SDGs were actually put together and it has a, a particular slogan that say, leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. Yes. yes, absolutely. Now, if I pick on SDG 7, which is the topic we are discussing today, I have to say the 1.50 degrees that the world is pursuing today while everybody is here, it is not an issue to be pursued alone by the developing, developed countries. You know, but I can tell you that going to 2030 or maybe afterwards, you, the, the most developing countries will still be left behind because the truth is the policies and also the technology for them to gradually transit to where most of these developed nations are is not there. I can agree, for example, Kenya, Ghana, which is the capital city, but for example, my country, Nigeria, there are no, for example, adequate roadmap or policies to drive to achieving it. So my question is to the big giant, I know that there are some big companies that have left maybe their country and they are now in Africa and they are giving negative subsidies. I know most people don't want to hear that word, the negative subsidy, they just say subsidy and the externalities that comes with it. We need a global partnership, a global support, so that also financing some of these cold Microphone closer to your yes, mouth, yes. Financing some of these Dirty energy in some of these developed countries, you leave it in your countries and you are financing it in Africa. 
I heard about partnership and support. You need to work harder. Yeah. Otherwise, by the time you have succeeded in transiting and you have a, a, a sustainable process, you'll be facing a bigger challenge of going to Africa, developing countries to bring them to that. So it's going to be a future challenge. Okay. You solve your problem. It's, it's a good question. Africa. It's so gone on for a bit now. What do so, we do? Yeah, what yeah. do we do? Yeah. yeah. Anybody want to answer this question? Countries where it's uh, they're being left behind. I, I think that uh, that's exactly what I talked about when I said not to sort of invest in, in old technology in the, in, in the global south, but rather secure that you invest in the latest technology across the board, but also supporting that investment independent if it's renewable energy or mobile technology or, or vehicles. Uh, definitely needs to, to be uh, done right from the start. I think that is the key, not to start in the wrong way and say that uh, uh, countries in the global south uh, can sort of uh, start on the same wrong path. It's better to start on the right path from the beginning. So I think that that is, is what, I, what, what I was trying to talk about earlier. Uh, uh, when we're talking about the energy side, so uh, Jonas, you wanted to come yeah. in on this. Yeah, no, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I totally agree, and uh, of course, it's a, a great concern that um, it has to be faster. There needs to be stronger partnering, and there needs to be more money in that area. And um, I think this Renew Africa program, that is uh, EU program, is one way, but I think it needs to be faster. And I agree, nobody should be left uh, on, behind. It's a pity, I think, in the Nordic, you should probably talk and work more on that topic than making the Nordic also much better because there is a huge opportunity to support that part of the world with the latest technology because it's available. Yes. Thank you very much for the question. We, we are present in very many countries in Africa. In Nigeria we are pretty small but now we are stepping up our efforts and we have a number of electricity projects that we are approaching also with financing from EKN, SEK, the Swedish financing arm and then we are establishing ourselves with the, with local people and, and building a company. So that's in our plans, and I'm sorry that we are not bigger than we are in Nigeria, but we're, we're striving for it. So thanks for the question. We don't want to leave anyone behind, and Nigeria is a fantastic country. Can, can, can I maybe just add something there? I mean, I lived in Kenya for 13 years, and in Kenya, the government was very interested in renewable energy, right? They have uh, geothermal on the Great Rift Valley, uh, and they have developed that now extensively with, with many megawatts. And, uh, you know, the, the largest wind farm in sub-Saharan Africa is now in northern Kenya, in Turkana. And they got a lot of support from, you know, governments, <clears throat> from the business sector, from the World Bank and others, because Kenya seemed to be a good partner. So I think governments have to be a good partner too. And I know your beautiful country. I spent time in the Ogoni uh, lands, uh, assessing with the team the, the damage from the Shell Development uh, Petroleum Corporation. And we presented that to Jonathan Goodlook, the president, and nothing happened. So, you know, I'm sorry, I, you don't need to answer this question. I, I'm okay to answer it, aren't I? I? I've seen countries in Africa embrace partnership, and I've seen others maybe a bit slower to embrace it. And I think that's very important, the, the, the government concerned being an equal partner, yeah. Um, anybody else? Oh, yes, gentlemen over here. We'll take one last question, and then we need to raid the sandwiches. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Komla Amijaku from Ghana. Uh, my question is, um, one of the panel talk about green, tra uh, green job transition, and how uh, people are adapting to the new way of uh, so we were talking about the loss of job in uh, fossil fuel yeah. and then uh, the new transition. But um, the developing countries are not having this kind of technology to train the youth in the new, way, new transition. So how is your company, uh, the developed country, are making sure that they can be able to do the same in a developing country to be able to bring aboard the youth that into this yeah. fossil fuel company. Yeah, to Thank be trained you up much. for green jobs. Very important. Yeah. Okay, so at Ericsson we have a project called Connect to Learn uh, that we have run for, for many years. We are present in, in very many countries and, and have trained over 200,000 people. And, and the beauty of it is that it is a digital platform 
Uh, so uh, all the information is available everywhere. We also, as part of that program, have specific curriculums for universities that are online where also employees are supporting. And, and we are building this up in, in many countries in Africa, providing for universities to know about 5G, for instance. So we uh, have tra developed a training course on 5G that is free, that we can give to any university. And, and in many countries in Africa, uh, universities are now partnering up with the, the Ministry of Education, with Ericsson, to provide this uh, training. So both on, on sort of digital skills for youth, as well as for, for university level students. And then uh, a digital platform to provide that training. So we are really doing that and we are partnering up with our uh, customers in so MTN or, or Orange in, in, in Africa uh, to, to provide uh, connectivity for schools as well. So definitely we are taking this seriously to secure that digital skills come because digital inclusion, if digitalization is so important for, for climate action, of course we cannot leave anyone behind so we need to train the people in digital skills. So we are doing that. Anybody else want to quickly answer this question? Yes? Our friend from the International Energy Agency. Hi, th thank you very much for, for the question. One, uh, one recent piece of work that I'd like to highlight from the IEA, we recently released our le recommendations of our Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions. And this was a commission that had very active participation from uh, African countries and very, very important and valuable inputs. So I'd really uh, emphasize that uh, clean energy transitions and uh, reskilling are, are very uh, important issues that countries are already focusing on. So I would also say, uh, but he's not listening, I would also say you should go straight after this round to the UN pavilions. You should find UNITAR, which is the United Nations International Training and whatever organization. Okay. You should also go to some of the governments here including the German government, because they're very big with uh, training for sustainable development through GIZ, part of their foreign, uh, foreign development support. Uh, probably Sweden, CEDA has some work on this as well. Uh, there are many, many places. Go to the British Council in Ghana and ask them, what are they doing for training? You may find some surprises there. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, but often people don't know where to go. And I think that's the problem. All right. Thank you very much indeed, everybody here. Thank you so much for being our guests, being our audience. Thank you to all our panelists, uh, those that came in on the magic of Zoom or Teams or all these other systems we have these days and the ones that were physically in the room. Uh, yeah, have a super day. Bye-bye. Thank you.